I'm delighted uh, to introduce the uh, artists and, and first and foremost, of course, Dr. Claire Aris, our old friend who has been a pioneer in the uh, research on Tibetan contemporary art. We are very happy that she's with us today. Uh, she has written extensively. A recent book came out a few months ago. It's there it is, and you can actually, I think we can even sell copies, and you should buy them. Uh, it's a great um, a contribution to the field, um, and um, she's here with uh, Emma Martin from the Liverpool Museum, who has also been interested for many years, uh, and actually acquired works from uh, some of our artists for the Liverpool Museum collection a few years ago. Um, and then, uh, starting from the right, Kezan Lamdark, um, from Zurich, uh, Tenzin Rigdo from Queens, New York, Palden Weinreb from New York, Sering Sherpa from Auckland, California, and Tashi Norbu from Holland. All of these, of course, from Tibet, most important. And we are very excited to have five artists here today. Three of them arrived yesterday, and two of them today. Some of them are uh, a very long journey, of course. So. Uh, but they are very excited to be here too. And thank you very much everybody and I think Claire will give you the microphone. Thanks. Thank you so much Fabio um, and our thanks to everybody at the uh, Rossi Rossi Gallery um, here for making this fabulous exhibition happen and for and I'd like to say thank you to all of you for coming because this is certainly I think one of the largest turnouts for an exhibition in this gallery space as you know I think some of you uh, the Rossi Gallery has been specializing in Tibetan contemporary art for some time now and individual artists have had shows here over the last how many years now Fabio? Uh, Eight years, eight years, right. So um, so today we're here to celebrate and investigate and uh, think about collectively the show that has been put on today, which is actually a show of work by artists, 17 different artists from all over the, shall I call it, the Tibetan-speaking world. So that's artists who are based still in, in Tibet, in, in the People's Republic, um, and artists from the Tibetan diaspora. Now, um, uh, I thought my job today, just as a, an introduction, in case there are some of you who don't know too much yet about uh, Tibetan contemporary art, is just to say a little bit about it before we move into the experts themselves, of course, are the artists who've been creating this extraordinary work. And I suppose I want to just pick up on that point I just made about the crucial notion that of what is Tibetan contemporary art. Uh, it is something that is absolutely now a, um, a mobile and a global phenomenon. Uh, not only in terms of where it's being produced, i.e. in, as I said, the Tibetan-speaking areas of the People's Republic, and in the diaspora, whether it's in South Asia, places like India, Nepal, the long-standing Tibetan uh, exile communities in those parts of the world, but also much more dispersed now and across, as you've just heard, particularly in North America and other parts of Europe. So to me, as an academic and, uh, and a curator, this is a fascinating phenomenon in itself because it means that we can't classify art just on the basis of, of where the work is being produced, but uh, unless we think of it in a global context. So there may be some uh, issues to touch upon on, on that subject today about the kind of global dissemination of the idea of Tibet plus the global spread of those who are of Tibetan heritage. Um, and uh, we're getting to the idea, I think, to the stage now where we have a kind of, a kind of multiply hyphenated notion of what Tibet is and Tibetans are and what Tibetan contemporary art therefore might be because it's being produced as we know in uh, in California in New York in Holland uh, as just as it is at this very moment also in Lhasa and in Dharamshala and various other places but this is an extraordinary thing because when I started doing my PhD research back in the early 1990s there was hardly anybody who would use that term Tibetan contemporary art who considered themselves to be a contemporary artist within shall we say the Tibetan cultural tradition and so what we're witnessing and you are now part of is something is part of that efflorescence this huge surge of activity that has gone on between say well actually starting in the 1980s particularly in Lhasa actually and then gradually spreading to all these different Tibetan communities around the world and uh, as I say we are um, in the presence today of some of the pioneers and the key figures 
in that, uh, that hugely developing and very rapidly developing movement. So I want to say something about that, just about the kind of idea and the kind of um, uh, the, the rapid development since, you know, since Fabio has been uh, exhibiting and, uh, and curating and uh, uh, this, this art coming from both t uh, Tibet and from, from exile um, in just in eight years. Uh, the number of exhibitions being produced, the number of works being produced, and the number of, of people, of individuals who call themselves Tibetan artists in a contemporary mode has uh, flourished enormously. The other thing, though, is that um, uh, I also wanted to just think about the kinds of themes that maybe arise in the work of Tibetan contemporary artists and which are expressed today in this show in various ways, before handing over to Emma, who's going to talk more specifically about the relationship between the historic objects on display in this show and the contemporary artworks. Um, reading some of the commentaries from the artists who produce work for this show, there's an awful lot of uh, emphasis on a set of um, key words, I think, that we might want to think about. Words that occur in their commentaries are loss, displacement, the impact of the Cultural Revolution, destruction and demolition uh, associated with that. Um, ideas of sanctity, religious um, aura, ritual and where, how those are preserved, perpetuated or maybe adapted and modernised in new contexts. Um, and uh, the idea both of, as I say, these, these, these troubling uh, notions of, of loss and destruction and what is not present any longer in Tibet itself, or maybe accessible to those who live outside of Tibet in the diaspora, meaning the kind of material heritage of Tibet. I think one of the key things that many artists, contemporary Tibetan artists who I've spoken to are engaged in, see themselves as engaged in, is a new way of making a kind of a form of Tibetan culture that uh, expresses their own interests as individuals, their own ideas about Tibet and, and their collectivity of, of members of the Tibetan community globally. Um, and uh, and these, uh, these new ways of thinking also as a form of dissemination that these artworks are, as I said earlier, we've got this notion of the, of the artist and of the idea of Tibet as a mobile concept globally spreading around the world. But we also have these artworks participating very crucially in the dissemination of ideas about Tibet, these new ideas, these new ways of thinking about what Tibetan culture might be, taking into account rupture, loss, destruction, and so many other features that have been uh, dominant in the history of Tibet since 1950. So, um, so uh, I want to, uh, today, I think we want to concentrate on celebrating the achievement of these artists in, in, in giving us a point of entry into the way that Tibetan history uh, impacts upon them individually and the way that it might enable us to think about that in aesthetic forms, in, in forms that are ravishingly beautiful, as you can see around you now, and intellectually um, challenging. So these are all a number of new, new ways, new, new um, ambassadorial objects allowing us to engage here in London with things that pertain to people who are in Lhasa at this moment or in California or wherever else in the global Tibetan diaspora. So uh, that I think is just, uh, that is probably quite sufficient from me. <laughs> um, but I do just want to say one little thing before I hand over to Emma. There, of course, I think this is Emma's main, main theme, but just to say that as we're standing in this room with these extraordinary book covers, this extraordinary legacy of basically the speech of the Buddha himself in, the, in material form. This, I know, was one of the inspirations for uh, Tenzin Rigdal, who is the curator of this show, in fact, and the idea of how those objects, which of course are associated with the word, the speech and word of the Buddha, could then be translated, as I said, into these kind of new forms. Um, but there's also an interesting phenomenon which is really about the way that Tibet has been kind of museumized, which is the subject of, uh, of that book that I've just produced, um, and the way that we, what we have, what, we can, what is retained in museums, galleries, um, and in private collections, um, uh, especially outside of Tibet, um, uh, is this extraordinary um, material legacy. So I think it's going to be really fascinating to see, to hear how the artists respond to that, how these things have been preserved despite the, uh, the otherwise um, dramatic impact of other forms of, uh, of forms of destruction that occurred earlier in Tibet's history. Okay, thank you very much. I think I need to pass yeah, you over. Um, to, uh, over. Okay. okay. How to follow that? Um, well, <laughs> I'm here as a, a museum person who 
has traditionally looked after historical collections from Tibet. Um, we're very lucky in Liverpool particularly, but there are great collections right across the UK of material that have come to collections uh, historically from Tibet in relation to the Anglo-Tibetan encounters of the early 20th century. And so some of the material that you see here, these fabulous uh, book covers that you see from the 13th and 14th century, are remnants in some respects, particularly in museum collections, of those encounters with Tibet, material encounters with Tibet in the early 20th century. And what I find particularly interesting is for some of the artists here today, they have separated what is of interest to them. I think there is the difference between whether to look at the text, what is held in between the book covers, or to whether to look at the book covers themselves. They are seen as two almost separate things. There are a couple of works that are, we have one glowing right just here, that combine both. But for the most part, there's a separation. And we find that in museums as well, this sort of sense of a regime of value, what is valued as art, what is valued as um, a literary tradition. And what I'm most interested in here today is to see how the text, what is not here. So we don't have the texts here today. We have the objects which are seen as art, which are the book covers. And so it's very interesting to see that several of the artists have engaged with actually what is missing, the painter, the actual text themselves, and try to see through this idea of loss, which is what Claire talked about earlier, how we can start to put these two sections back together. Um, so you often find within the museum context, you'll find that the book covers are classed very much as an art object. They are not necessarily seen for their utility value in a sense, or their, um, their, the sense of bringing communities or bringing individuals together. Um, they're seen primarily as, as art objects. We forget often that they held sacred texts within them. And so it's very interesting to see some of these works pulling the literature back to the book cover. Um, I don't want to say much more because we've only got so much time to do that, but I was particularly pleased to be um, involved in this because we are in Liverpool trying to have a dialogue between the contemporary and the historical works to bring a fresh um, perspective to historical objects, and I think that has been done extremely well with this exhibition here. So I would now like to hand back to Claire. Who wants to start? Do we want to... Okay. Hello. Thank you, everyone, for coming. And um, so, uh, when Fabio uh, approached me and asked if I would be willing to curate a uh, show, and um, and we were thinking how and uh, what title and how to include artists and all. And um, and then um, I proposed In Between, and uh, it's the closest uh, translation of what Tibetan would use, the word pardo. And um, many times when I talk to friends, uh, Tibetan friends, writers or filmmakers and all, we always refer to our state of being as in pardo, where um, you are... Uh, where you are in between uh, being born and dead. So I always see uh, uh, the uh, Tibetan uh, struggle or Tibetan uh, livelihood in exile or in Tibet as in that state of uh, mind where your, uh, your country's uh, problem is not completely solved yet. And in between that, we are uh, creating something uh, doing something and um, also in all this uh, uh, interesting uh, intellectual fields what I notice is there really um, hasn't been much of a strong cultural dialogue or cultural exchange because most of what has happened has uh, all the Tibetan uh, classical literature or religion everything is uh, translated into English or German or French and all this language, but nothing really has been translated back into uh, Tibetan language. And um, 
I think probably, I mean, there are a few very handful uh, individuals, even in Tibet, who are doing that job. And, uh, but uh, the only very um, evident uh, cultural dialogue, you see it in artwork, where artists are really uh, looking at the Western art history and also looking at the uh, classical Tibetan art history and then trying to, um, you know, fuse or understand and then bring all this uh, artwork. So, uh, and then um, I picked all these great artists <laughs> and I'm uh, uh, very happy and uh, so I think that's it. <laughs> so maybe Paldin can talk a bit more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the question. Sorry, I hope you don't mind me, but I'm going to sit, if that's okay. Um, so I guess we're talking about it works, the piece. Um, I did the aforementioned glowing manuscript, uh, titled Blue. Uh, and when I heard about the exhibition and page, I thought it was a very interesting topic. Uh, there's definitely a wealth of potential, and I think um, the work's really come through. Uh, for me in particular, even though it was based on Pecha covers, when I think of Pechas, I think of the power of knowledge that's held in between the covers itself. I think that's the real wealth, and um, I guess that's worth exploring for sure, which is why I chose to illuminate the uh, insides of the uh, clear click uh, pages, which uh, for me, you know, connotates enlightenment and spiritualism, which kind of feeds into my work in general. You know, it's kind of ambiguous spirituality. And I think I'm, I'm drawn to ambiguity because it tends to lead to a more universal read, which I think can be much more beneficial. I mean, I mean obviously, Tibetan Buddhism is a jumping off point, but I think parallels can be drawn between uh, different religions. I think there's large connections and has a larger comment on, um, I don't know, religion or spirituality or kind of making that point or going past the bar, though, if you put it. Um, so for me, I, I chose to, uh, in case of piece in wax, which is indicative of um, kind of my paintings as well, it's the sense of encasement, and I liked having this um, disconnection or this unavailabi unavailability with the wax, so it could be um, kind of this mysticism or this unknown quality, which could be, um, I don't know, kind of merges the kind of this primitive aesthetic with what's been lost, potentially, with uh, what's still unknown, and um, I thought it was worth exploring for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, what else was there? Oh, thanks so much. Should I, should, could you just sure. Uh, what a Pecha is precisely? Because I'm not sure everybody may know. Pecha, I'm not sure if I'm the best person for this. <laughs> 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 uh, you want to talk about Pecha? Uh, I think um, basically the Tibetan um, scriptures, they call it uh, in Sanskrit sutra. And uh, sutra means string. Uh, string, I think it's a tradition of India where when they when you have a friend or guest or kings, you put a, a garland of mala, you know. Uh, and then um, all those uh, flowers were held by the string, which you don't see, but you can infer. And um, I think the, the sutra in that uh, meaning, it, it might mean essence or... Uh, or the core, or um, all these things. So, in traditionally, they have all this in leaves, or even in bamboos and all uh, engraved, and um, and um, just to protect it, you have all this uh, uh, cover. And um, sometimes, I think, in uh, I was told by my uncle that in Tibet, when s uh, some of these scriptures were written in gold and all those things, and it's so considered very valuable that. Uh, it's covered so well that nobody reads it, <laughs> and and they will put you put it on your head, you know, and um, you get receive the blessing, and uh, yeah. So it's uh, and also it's interesting that um, many of these scriptures. I think uh, uh, one of the scholars, Jin Smith, was talking about how I mean he's passed away, but um, how long time back. Um, in Bauda and all in India and all, people were selling uh, scriptures piece by piece as a as an art object or antique object, and he saw that and uh, how these things were uh, being uh, sold individually and um, so I, I think just the uh, scripture itself I think ha might have a very interesting journey where somebody wants to destroy it, 
somebody wants to protect it, hide it, and then get lost, and then somebody finds it, there are half of it, and then somebody wants to reinterpret that s- scripture, and then it goes on and on, and um, and in my piece, uh, um, it gets uh, a contemporary treatment to it. Uh, I got this scripture, uh, I believe it's 13th, 15th century, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, um, they were not complete, and I was, uh, Fabio asked me if there's anything you could do with it, so I kept it for a few years, yeah, because I tried to figure out how to uh, best uh, uh, treat it, and then I also sent it uh, to many of the monks and uh, a uh, few f- scholar friends that I know, and they analyzed it, and they said they are not really uh, any re- rare kind of scripture. That so traditionally, if you have uh, a scripture that is not complete, what they do is they'll either uh, burn it so that it's not uh, been misused or mistreated. And um, so I, I, I thought the best way f- uh, for me to uh, preserve it and also. Uh, uh, interpret was to use them and then, you know, and I use the pastel in it and uh, it smudges, uh, so it's uh, the sense of impermanence is there. Um, so, <coughs> yeah, I think um, also many of the ideas that uh, that comes to, uh, especially when you go to Dharamsala and all those things, is there's this strong idea of preservation of culture and I think it is more very much to do with the cultural revolution that when people start hearing about those things like oh the monastery everything's being destroyed and that this they were really um, clustered towards the idea of preservation but then when you think too much about preservation then the innovation or creativity is uh, doesn't have much space on it so um, I think many of the artists here are trying to deal with that dichotomy of uh, preserving, but at the same time, uh, innovating. How do you deal with that? I think this, um, for me personally, that's a, uh, I struggle with that. I think many of the artists too, so. Honey, guess on. Chik Okay. Um, first time I see these uh, book covers. <laughs> Um, well, for me, it's, uh, I grew up in Switzerland, and uh, I grew up with a Swiss family, and uh, my father is a Tibetan priest, so I come from this uh, religious uh, background, but I grew up in Switzerland, I'm completely lost somehow, and uh, uh, I looked at it very visually and uh, so like I'm gonna make a study out of it and uh, my work was uh, to have these uh, beer cans which I have on the bottom make uh, these holes and then you look inside and somehow it it's like this book cover where you look inside and you see when the light hits it then you see uh, uh, enlightenment inside the beer can so I hope it uh, <laughs> relates to this book of it. Yes. So. Yeah. It's in the back there, yes. But then I had before, I only worked with cans, round cans. and um, But then I had like this uh, turpentine uh, cans and they have like this kind of shape of, 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 of a square uh, or a length square. So. I took those um, mm, images and uh, just make a study out of it because uh, I find it very beautiful to do it. So, right. I was going to say to Kitan, do you want to say something about how different that imagery is from some of your other beer cans? Oh, yes, it's very different. (laughs) This this is like the kind of, you know, the the particular version of uh, of your work, right? Yes. Responding very directly to kind of Buddhist imagery, whereas in other things, maybe you don't always do that. I don't always do that, so when I saw it, <laughs> so those, uh, yes, I was really fascinated, and then I had these Buddha figures, and I really uh, took me like, uh, I don't know, a whole day, uh, just punching in, needles and needles, until 
it, it gets like uh, the, I'm making the aluminium very soft with, with my needle and then it goes through after a while so it's also kind of meditating so working on a little piece like this Uh, hello, my name is Tsering, uh, Tsering Sherpa, and uh, I was born in Nepal uh, to a Tibetan family and uh, trained as a traditional Tibetan artist by my father, who is also an artist, uh, since the age of 13. And uh, in the last uh, several years, uh, I was also actually working as a professional traditional Tibetan artist in the beginning, but uh, in the last like five, six years, uh, when I saw and heard a lot about like what was happening inside Tibet, um, the art movement, and also uh, living in California for almost 10 years, uh, sort of got to uh, see many uh, artworks and visit museums and understand a little bit about uh, the Western art movement as well. So uh, which actually uh, sort of inspired me to uh, attempt to do something new, uh, something just uh, not just the traditional Tibetan art, but something to experiment with. And uh, so uh, for this, uh, show I made the three pieces which is in the back there uh, it's in the shape of uh, scriptures uh, traditional uh, pecha that uh, Rigdol was describing earlier um, I almost for about 25 years I was working with uh, traditional imagery and uh, I've been very fascinated with these images because uh, when we were trained in the traditional style uh, the images are very exacting and uh, all the descriptions and symbolisms and there's also a measurement system that one has to follow in order to draw these images. So uh, that was very, um, that sort of like uh, is something that I wanted to work with on what happens if I were to manipulate these images, their form, and uh, what comes out of it and how the viewers will interact with the object uh, or the painting. So uh, it's an uh, image of Mahakala, which is like the protector deity. I paint it in three different colors and manipulate the, the images so that it uh, has some of the uh, indication of a Mahakala, but at the same time, it looks like almost like an abstract design. Uh, uh, to me, uh, for this show, uh, in between is a very interesting idea, like what Rigdol was earlier saying, uh, like something unborn or something dissolving at the same time. And uh, I was trying to co uh, also see like many of these religious objects from Tibet, uh, when it is, uh, removed from its original environment, how it uh, functions in a different space and time. And that was uh, really fascinating. So that was an attempt. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, I would like to uh, thank you for the gallery. Um, Rasin Rossi and Denzri Grilla for uh, curating the exhibition and inviting me as an artist, guest artist, to this show. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I should say it's like um, a historical moment for Tibetan uh, art. Uh, I cannot define classical art and uh, contemporary art. I think it's just the art direction of Tibetan uh, artistic uh, world. Um, because I was, uh, uh, my name is Tashi, Tashi Nurbu, and that is my painting. And uh, you could see um, uh, there is a painting um, of Buddha and mandala, and, um, and 
maybe the the subject in between um, and the manuscript you don't really see it there but um maybe i could relate a uh, little bit uh like earlier uh Rigdula and they said uh, in the ramsala and that this very big thing with uh, uh, the preservation of Tibetan culture so i'm from the ramsala and um we have this uh, sargon belating uh dalai lama's palace there's a whole lot of uh, tibetan scriptures that the monks they just throw or in the to burn them this like a historical a uh, religious uh, stupa there and then i whenever i go to dharamsala i just go there and look around collect some uh, scriptures and then um it's very difficult to like they're asking the monks there what are you going to do with that it's very difficult to answer i'm going to use it in my art <laughs> it's very uh, funny or for me to express that way anyhow i mean that's like I've studied uh, Western art and um, also the Tibetan art. I mean, my, my life, I mean, it's like 20 years, half of my 20, uh, life was in the traditional art. And then I went to Belgium and then I live in Holland, spent with the contemporary uh, uh, experimenting how to bring the, how to paint the Tibetan um, motifs or the things that I've studied, spent my years. Those, how, how I could bring it to the, um, Western world, that's where I live, so how I can communicate with it. So that kind of experiment, and I get these uh, scriptures, just package of them <laughs> from uh, Dramsa, that's like, a, some of them are really, really old, and I, I just plug them, that's like in the, in your, in the Western uh, art medium, you have the, just collage, you call it, you know, and then you plug them, and it kind of like a mixed media kind of, so I'm, I'm, I've been very busy actually, like, and then you could see the whole lot of scriptures behind, and then I draw on top. And then you see the t classical mandala on the, this image of it, and then the Buddha on the other side. So for me, it's like Tibet is like, okay, is it when you call, talk about Tibet, the Buddha, you have this Buddhism, and then the mandala is like a two different things. So I tried to make it is like, uh, there's two different subjects there, so it's like, can I really combine them, you know, in one? So I was trying to figure out with um, putting the clouds back and forward, you know, like, and then some, like you could see the Rolling Stones uh, tank, his logo. Um, really uh, uh, studying with the, the, the media, the, the technique, and there are lots, actually, I call it adventure of my life. So I, I came through certain this kind of result uh, on my art. So and like the white Buddha, um, I mean in Tibetan, uh, I cannot say I'm practicing Buddhism, you know, <laughs> because but uh, in our school you have the, the compulsory that you have to go every morning, even Sundays, you know, you have to go there do these rit <laughs> rituals and, and evening and all those things. We we are brought up. We, we have no. Uh, options not to go you know so it's part of our life and then now that it comes all in uh you know we, we know the best i mean I, if you are buddha become my subject and you know, this you can't escape from it so that's kind of uh, how if i visualize buddha then that's like pure kind of buddha you know white and then the, the things go around there you might see on top the tintin I and mean, that's very Belgian. So I, I was trained in Belgium. <laughs> so Belgians are very good in uh, comic books. And then below there's, um, we call it Suske and Viske. The Viske is like um, the girl. And that's from a color which is uh, comics. You know, there's like a, and I just draw them. You know, and then I'm, I'm really enjoy my own way of drawing. That's more like, a, for me it's more like experimenting and then, um, if you ask many, what's the meaning of things? Things um, there, are, there are a lot. Symbol, all the Tibetan motifs are full of symbolism, and in fact, as earlier said, we're trying to um, uh, to make it a little bit loose. The idea of the sacred, and then actually the contemporary art for also uh, in in my society, in my world, Tibetan, I think uh, it's very very important uh, to paint as much as possible the contemporary art that really, first of all, to change my own society. Not to change really, but to uh, bring new awareness. Um, how we could uh, 
make it move forward or leave the old rhythm and then make something i don't know what you know best <laughs> actually it was all explained a little bit so this is actually i'm explaining my painting how i painted it so that's more or less i should yeah it, yeah thank you very much <laughs> Thank you so much to all of the artists. Um, I wonder if I might um, abuse my position of power here and just ask a, a question to all of you. Um, and maybe uh, Emma might want to come in with another question and then we will move to the floor um, and, and ask if, for, for questions from, from you guys. I'm, I'm conscious that some of you might be in pain standing at the back there. So we'll try and move on a little bit. Um, something that comes out, I think, from all of, all of the comments that you've made as artists and, and to me you know, has to be asked in the context of this exhibition as well, is just a really very fundamental thing. Um, if you, in fact, I was listening to something on the radio the other day. To, there was a discussion about contemporary art in in uh, in America, I think it was, and the discussion was basically about Western art history, and it was basically said that art in the West since the Renaissance onwards has basically been about a process of moving away from religion. That you know that art from the Renaissance onwards was basically not about religion, not tied to religion, either in practice or in ideology or in even necessarily even in content. Certainly, by the time you get to modernism and afterwards, so and yet you guys um, are all, it seems to me, in some way related to the concept of religion in your work, and of course specifically of Tibetan Buddhism, and. Although um, I think, um, and of course, that is to do with a whole set of issues in terms of Tibetan culture and Tibetan cultural politics. I would really like to hear your answer to that question about why you do, despite the fact that you're very cutting edge contemporary artists in many senses, this subject of religion, especially for this show today, is still so dominant. Is it something that you always want to be to be there in your work? Is it something fundamental to the definition of, of who you are as artists or as as Tibetans? Can I, I, perhaps I'll pass the, right, right back to Kesang and then come back to you, Tashi. Come back down the road. <laughs> like, uh, uh, yes, um, like uh, my father is a Tibetan Rinpoche, but I grew up in Switzerland. I grew up in a Swiss family, and I got to know Tibetan religion through my Swiss father, actually. So it's, uh, it's, I got it not through my father, I got it through my Swiss father. <laughs> so, that's how I know uh, Tibetan religion, through my Swiss father, actually. Because um, my Tibetan is very poor, so I can really get really deep the conversation in Tibetan, so I won't understand everything. So, But my Swiss father, he got involved in Tibetan religion, and um, he was a curator of the Rikon Monastery. And then he got like... Um, he got a, a Sige Young Institute, or, and he wrote a book about Buddhism, and the most of my Buddhism I got from, from the West. Mm -hmm. well, the translation. <coughs> Actually, I think, um, I don't think it's running or getting rid of the religion, but it seems rather the Western thought has move uh, towards individualism, individual expression. Mm -hmm. So uh, with respect to Tibetans, so I think it's a similar approach, I think, where um, prior to uh, the Chinese invasion of Tibet, and uh, Tibet is almost every aspect of Tibetan uh, daily practice is looped or uh, somehow related to Tibetan Buddhism. So in so many ways, you can say Tibetans were footnotes of Buddha. And um, so when you have this very big, uh, giant, uh, uh, almost like a, a Buddha everywhere, and you want to create something new, and if you do um, the best way, I thought, either one approach would be to completely negate it. and. Uh, and then the other approach would be to see if you can somehow uh, find a space uh, where you are not completely uh, negating it, but at the same time inviting a, a, a sense of creativity in it. So once I was asked, uh, why do you, uh, m some Tibetans would actually not really appreciate and say like, why would you use Buddha? And um, And I would say, 
because um, if you want to see um, a evolution rather than a mutation, then um, it's almost like there's a father and a mother, and the child would look a little bit like a father and mother, but then the child's child would look a little different. So this is, you know, so uh, I think um, in a way, uh, many of the artworks that I see uh, that my friends are doing or other Tibetan, many of the contemporary Tibetan artists are doing is like almost like a bridge art that's forming a bridge where uh, slowly uh, you are um, bringing a secular art, which is uh, somehow, I think the art, I think the Tibetan art should be independent of uh, religion. And you can do that only by uh, using the elements of uh, uh, Tibetan traditional icono, uh, uh, icons and all those things and slowly saying that, you know, like the very word religion, connecting oneself to the source, like really bringing it and personalizing the Buddha and slowly and slowly and I think, uh, so I think the, the approach and the movement is same, I think, but the direction is towards individualism. They're going towards individual expression, I think, rather than going away or uh, reacting to the very religion in a negative way. Um, well, for me, religion is more of, um, well, it interests me in a certain sense, and that, simply put, it explains our own existence in a certain way, which always fascinates me, and uh, we're always still questioning where it's coming from. And um, other things apart from that is just, you know, the potential of another world. Um, that's uh, within our realm, but we can't see, or it's, yeah, yeah, exa exactly. Um, and I think it just fascinates me. And I think a lot of artists strive to um, answer those type of questions. And it's inherent, more or less. And to speak what, what you're talking about before is that we all have our own beliefs. And in some ways, even with our artistic practice, you know, it's almost um, more of a personal religion, uh, as opposed to, um, I don't know, something that's more prescribed. I think uh, for me, it's more of an investiga investigative analysis. Uh, I think even in Tibetan Buddhism, if we were to look at deeper, it's more about investigating oneself and one's... Uh, so there is like subject and object and how we investigate, it, investigate the process of subject uh, observing an object or about the process of the mind and meditation, etc. So it's uh, probably in the similar line, like, uh, and besides I use the many of the religious icons because I've been working with them in the last 20 so years. So I find it much more comfortable and uh, much more near to these images and imageries and to find a way to reinterpret them in, in uh, contemporary context, like uh, at present time, on how I see or observe it. So, I think. Um, in my point of view, um, um, I'm uh, from like Belgium, Holland, you know, it's very much, uh, sometimes very Catholic there. <laughs> so, um, also very much uh, the Tibetan, uh, our culture, completely based on Buddhism. Um, in my case, it's very difficult to jump in right away um, in the contemporary uh, world. Uh, during my study year uh, in Kent, in Belgium, and my even my teacher uh, said, I was always trying to put the Buddha into more contemporary, and he said, no, you kill the Buddha, then only you learn Contemporary, I was very offended. <laughs> it's like uh, uh, traumatizing, you know. <laughs> but uh, then uh, later, after years, then I thought, okay, that's what he meant. Uh, I just have to forget about it. Then I learned the abstract, just few colors, you know, all this experimental. And then later, then you know the medium properly. And then only that's like a tool uh, to express the your own uh, wish or uh, uh, let, let's say Tibetan uh, artistic, uh, we have only tanka painting and uh, mandalas, you know, like that 
um, is understood also by Tibetan uh, the best, our own uh, people. So I'm looking from that perspective. Um, like in the in the in Europe and uh, in the West, you have the 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 old masters and then the, the Renaissance and the modern art contemporary. Like uh, everything has stages, you know. And uh, in in my case, um, I'm still on the process of uh, uh, experimenting how I could just um, go <laughs> really abstract, you know. So it's it's a little bit like a process there, and then. I want to experiment that myself, you know. So and also, uh, also the Tibetan, uh, the six million Tibetans can understand. Also, um, I want to know how they think, you know, how we could uh, give some inspiration. How um, that's main idea for me. Uh, of course, the you uh, in the West you can understand very well. It's like a long history has been to uh, beyond, you know. In our case, not. So we are like. I'm just following the the people of my country, like how their brain is working, you know, like stage by stage. So that's all I could say. I think still I see a very strong Buddha there in my work, you know, and then trying to put little, um, you know, it's like I'm just talking from a, um, a very my point of view. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, um, I might just add that, yeah, that you're quite right, of course, it's, you know, things are sort of speeding up tremendously in Tibetan, the history of Tibetan art, in that we're, we're only the first forays into anything other than sort of purely traditionalist tanka painting, where it was the 1940s, 1950s, and then the 1980s. So there's a huge you know, amount of um, uh, um, speed in terms of development going on in that very short space of time. Um, and perhaps I was thinking that within the audience here, we might, uh, the, uh, the Tibetan members of the audience might be able to give some response in a minute um, to, to how they respond to this kind of work and to the way that uh, you know the iconography of Buddhism and so on has been reworked. Um, but Emma, do you want to just um, put one more question and then we can open up to the floor? I just wanted to bring it back to the um, book covers. I just really, as a museum curator, we're constantly responding to the material world and particularly to the historical material world and trying to rethink it in some way and have some sort of commentary for um, the uh, museum visitor of today and to try and rethink, refresh how we think about our collections uh, for the 21st century. And I just really was wondering how the five of you responded to these uh, 13th, 14th century book covers when you, um, when this was proposed to you, that you would be working, being inspired by these book covers. How did you see them? Were they, did you see them as art? Did you look at the technique? Did you think of them as religious, spiritual holders? I'm just interested to see how each of you sort of interpreted them differently. Your works are all obviously very different, but how did you, uh, what was your instant reaction to them? For me, I thought like the book covers are much smaller and uh, because normally there are book covers like this big. <laughs> so I got like um, copies and I saw it and I, it's actually now it's the first time I see it like this big and uh, I'm really fascinated <laughs> or what. And I hear that they were like all covered with black. I mean, you couldn't even see it so you had to clean it up and then the, the whole thing came out the gold and everything. So. so this is the first time you've seen them in the flesh? This in the flesh, like this, this yes. Yes. Oh, for me. I mean, uh, not this other. Yeah. <laughs> for me, it was a, so I just, took, I just connect with you visually. So. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, whenever I see uh, any kind of uh, old Tibetan traditional, uh, whether it be tanka or any uh, uh, religious items, uh, the f my immediate first response is always uh, the feeling, uh, some like tragic, you know, it, it f um, because um, maybe the way I look at it. Sometimes uh, I look at it through the historical point of view, and um, some would look at it through artistic point of view. And my initial approach, most of the time, it has been always looking at it through historical point of view. <laughs> and so that is always um, 
not only with any kind of work and then slowly you start appreciating just looking at the aesthetic point of view and and then you realize this were done like hundreds and hundreds of years ago and um and then so i think um yeah so i i deal with uh, most of my work i deal with uh, those kind of feelings how uh, yeah so yeah something like that i i cannot really uh, <laughs> really pinpoint but um but it's always been a uh, uh, quite fascinating experience to especially when in museums and all those places when i see all this uh artwork uh, it's always very fascinating um i found the book covers to be um beautifully ornate but uh, relatively decorative in its nature and more so so it's a testament to the knowledge that's held within um and, and in some ways too you know the depictions of deities is kind of, it's kind of a human manifestation but the ideas have the ability to uh transcend themselves if that makes sense uh i think of the book covers like the sort of like a monastery for the actual deity so the actual deity i would think of it more of the scriptures which actually defines all the detailed information about the deity and like a map on the particular teachings or something like that so i was actually more looking into the uh, scriptures commenting on the scriptures rather than just the 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 cover of it and uh how again like uh uh any sacred object when it is displaced from its sacred environment what happens to the object so that's all that always fascinates me also like uh, being in america especially in california i see many people have like beautiful garden and sometimes you see this like uh, stone buddha in the garden and uh, sometimes i see them in the museums and sometimes even like in some wholesale shop with plastic buddhas you know so it's always very interesting to me how we approach to it uh i think being born in a tibetan family a uh, very very strict religious family uh i used to think like uh, before working with these objects uh i even told these stories to many of my friends if i were walking down like a street on california and if i were to see an image of a buddha lying on the floor uh my first intuition would be to pick it up and then like put it on the head so we have this like habit a uh, habituation or we are so used to seeing these images in a sacred form but at the same time sometimes the function of that whole teaching may not come through because if i were to see this object a uh, buddha image along with a homeless person let's say it's a buddha of compassion image of a buddha of a compassion and right next to it is a homeless person my probably my my intuition would be to pick it up and completely negate this person so i don't know if this is functioning in my like a uh, the thing action properly or not the whole teaching so it, there are many ways to look at it so it's it's a uh, it's an experimentation and investigation i guess so also those are book covers but they don't have any titles on it so you see only the image and i think if you look at the book cover you see already what is inside just visually so it's not a number or anything on it so regarding the book cover actually um i should uh, uh for me i when you look at it um it's like a wooden big thing you know uh very strong should, like what is it trying to protect you know so what is what goes inside is the tibetan buddhist text which the um, actually the those texts are if you go to tibetan monasteries bu- big buddha statues are below and the text these pictures goes on top in the monastery so that means the teachings is more important than buddha himself so that way if you look at it it's like okay they must be really protecting and the dalai lama when he escaped also he's carrying only the picture in his back so that kind of uh, i could share a little bit 
Yeah. Board, but I'm just thinking about the washboards, just thinking about the washboards in there. So they're what's been left behind. The text has been taken. Washboard is, is left and been transformed completely from a, um, a religious sacred object into an item of just absolute utility. I don't know if everybody has seen the washboards next door. I just wonder, I mean, they're very powerful objects, and I just wondered if every, how everybody responded to those particularly. They were completely transformed from what we see here to then, uh, you know, a washboard. As Nortse said, with, yeah. Thank you so much to everybody for um, for your discussion on the, those points. And uh, as Emma said, we want to encourage everybody to have a look at the work that's in the other room behind us as well, which you may not have had a chance to see yet, which includes these extraordinary book covers that have actually been used in uh, ways that they were certainly not designed for, like washboards. Um, there's also the work of Nordse from um, from Lassa, who's been making new versions of those uh, book covers, and uh, Gade's uh, tripartite new picture, amongst other things next door for you to see. But I feel very conscious that um, that it's quite warm that some people are standing um, so I think we should we should move on to having some questions from the, f the floor because I'm sure you are all burning to ask the artist something I should say though if you if you've you can have a chance to ask a question now but then you will also have a chance to ask a question uh, when we have a drink afterwards so maybe we'll take a few questions um, for, for in this setting and then uh, people can um, shake a leg and uh, and have a glass of <laughs> something to drink um, and we'll have a little bit more intimate kind of uh, discussion then so but would um, what are we going to microphone to the floor now well, Fabio I think you'll just have to shout loudly <laughs> um, so please um, can I uh, you'd like to start yeah the religious influence that is Buddhism in your context has been like partly responsible for um, hindering your creativity you know in terms of um, accessing your artistic mind because as far as I know um, Buddhism or most religions for that matter, it's about obedience and submission to the higher authority and order, as opposed to um, challenge and boldness and inner exploration and finding things yourself. So I have some serious doubt. Like I, I heard the good artist talk about how like he was made to uh, attend the morning prayers and his the father being a, a priest. So and uh, when I observe this art, I see like the. Um, the motive of Buddha and scriptures and like some religious aspect of the Tibetan life is omnipresent and um, I've seen very little of ideas that touch the global context as a whole, like the issue of um, like spread of technology, the issue of nuclear family, multiculturalism, you know, those international issues. So um, my contention is like Buddhism might have somehow like limited the intellectual reach. So, um, what do you guys think? Few. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I I think um, I think everyone would have an individual um, uh, opinion about what art is. And for me personally, it was about. Um, really looking at who really I am and not in a very deep philosophical way where in Tibetan Buddhism you say like I doesn't exist or something like that but in a very practical way when I think about it I realize that um, I am basically everything that I am right now has something to do with uh, what has happened in Tibet I'm a product of that, uh, what has happened in Tibet in 1959. And there onwards, and I don't think, um, I don't mean there uh, many of the artworks are disrespecting, but I don't think they're obeying, uh, per se. I think, um, uh, for, me, for me personally, I think uh, Tibetan Buddhism is one strong part. Tibetan culture is strong part. Tibetan politics is strong part. And all these elements and Tibetan issue this all makes it contemporary Tibetan. Um, so this is how I, I see. And um, also when you talk about limits of creativity, I think sometimes, um, I think then each individual would have their own upbringing and cumulative experiences. And if somebody is talking, uh, basically ev if everybody, every artist is talking about their opinion, I think it's kind of, uh, 
for me, uh, g- it, it will be genuine if I'm talking about my own uh, flaws, as you would say, but uh, or uh, my own limits that I experiment with. So, um, yeah, that's my uh, approach when I make artwork. Um, yeah. <coughs> For me, the imagery is more like a vocabulary, a language through which you are communicating with the uh, with the world, basically. So it's not necessarily like religious or anything, but we're more or less like using the image to talk about contemporary issues. So, I mean, over here in this show particularly, we have, uh, we're commenting on the book covers, but in a different context, uh, we could be talking about social issues, we could be talking about like uh, technology, we could be talking about, but using the same imagery. So it's more like a language that we are using it to communicate. Yeah, I think Srinla says the same, um, and then Srinla also. Uh, in a way, I hear Baldinla and uh, Ke- uh, Keslamdala is like a very modern, uh, different medium that they use. And um, I, I think the Rigdala and Sring and myself is more a little bit the uh, background of the traditional paintings. And I, for me, uh, if you ask, um, now we are dealing with the Westerners here a lot and some Tibetans, and also <laughs> later, home, back home, we are dealing with our own society, people, Tibetan. we see our cousins, we see our, calling our parents. I mean, the Tibetan world, um, this is about art, you know, painting, uh, basically, uh, installation art also. But then, uh, if you see in the Tibetan music world, you cannot believe it, there's a hip hop, whatever you want, you know, it's beyond. <laughs> so this, I think, um, we are dealing, actually, the Tibetan artists now, uh, with the time, that's the contemporary, means a little bit um, now, time now, you know, what we are facing with it. Like, we are wearing our, uh, not our dress. This is not uh, comfortable, or uh, we cannot say those things. Shall I say it? I don't know. So, I cannot walk in London with the <laughs> Tibetan chupas, you know? <laughs> so, that, <laughs> yeah, so, so myself, I don't know, but let's talk about how I see it. Uh, uh, that's, time now dealing with it you know so i think we when we are we are uh, our work is just painting so so many things goes on we're just studying about mentally 24 hours that's we are busy with ourselves so so that's how you see the um, so much influenced by the 21st century like you see in the scripture i was very happy to see this uh, actually the script the catalog is like my dream catalog you know <laughs> it's like bringing us back to the s- culture, you know, like mm-hmm. scripture. I mean, I see a lot of modern catalogs, like so thick and uh, so flashy, glossy, whatever you call it. It's not striking me, you know, when you see this, oh, am I Tibetan Buddhist artist or something, you know? So that really, this is, uh, shall I say, it really touched me to be part of it because that's like where my root is, you know? And again, you see in the back, like a scriptures, like uh, with the army and the supermarket and uh, those things, like, again, you know, that's the time now. So I don't know, but that's my explanation. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're referring to Gade's work at the back there, yes. yes. D- Palin, did you want to say anything or should we take another question? Okay. Well, we'll co- uh, so I think Lamachap, you had a question. Um, I think we need to be careful. When you look at, I think, Tibetan art, uh, especially so modern Tibetan art or modern Tibetan literature, there tends to be a lot of continuities within it, even within this contemporary art here. Uh, I think the question is that if you're looking at something called Tibetan contemporary art, what is Panka being produced now? Mm-hmm. Okay. In the traditional form, but you have just, if I ex- cite one example, the longest, biggest Panka in the world, the world record. There, the concept itself is, uh, I would say, is some sort of an epic narrative of the Tibetan nation. Mm-hmm. It is still Panka. It's still, t- you know, they chose the greatest artists in the traditional Tibetan artists. But the composition of it, the national narrative of it, 
everything is being informed by here and now. So is that contemporary art or what is it? That, that's one thing. And the other thing is also, it's not just religion, although today we're dealing with the book covers. It's not religion that we have art in, in Tibetan, uh, villages in Tibetan, especially in farming houses, you have a great sort of artistic symbols on the walls and on, on the, even the making of the houses is incredible. If you just cite one, let me cite one example. There is a village called Sangizhong, the plain of the lions in Zekong. Uh, it's famous for producing some of the greatest Tibetan kanka painters. If you go to the village now, the village has got this kind of healthy, constructive rivalry between families where they build the incredible paint, the incredible wool in the traditional Tibetan style, uh, and they produce incredible Tibetan artists. But there is something going on that is that the art is living. Uh, that's one thing. The other thing, I think, in terms of this um, scene, that Buddha images and everything, I think. Although this is a conscious, of course, you're an artist, and I'm not an artist, but uh, although this is a conscious composition of bringing in fragments of scriptures and uh, celluloids or maybe broken Buddhas, and this started uh, in the, uh, from Lhasa especially, uh, and, and if, you know, Vidin Chupil Gil, the artist, and Gunka Jamso, and in all this art, you will see Buddhas and scripts and uh, uh, broken, sort of broken heaps of images, you know, Buddhist images. And these images, I think one thing is conscious representation of contemporary Tibet. The other thing, the most important thing is this is the visual image that surrounds these artists during Cultural Revolution and after Cultural Revolution. So it is a representation of a contemporary Tibetan social existence. It's not necessarily trying to be rebel rebellious or submissive or anything. It's not actually. It's a, I would say sort of an accurate uh, you know, presentation, <coughs> presentation of it. Uh, so in Tibet, in, in the outside, in exile, diaspora is a bit, um, some people find it a bit offensive and things. But inside Tibet, yes, there were people who, were, who, did, you know, who disliked some of these images, but they were more accepting because they have been through the Cultural Revolution and because they were, also Tanja Zidola was saying, in terms of translating Western ideas, which I, I'm afraid I disagree with you. There's a lot of Western ideas translated into Tibetan language. If you look at modern Tibetan literature, you will see lots of this. Just one thing, you know, Marxism, Marxist ideas. You know, <laughs> das Kapital, <laughs> das Kapital, you know, das Kapital, German ideology, everything in Tibetan. So they received lots of ideas from the West. And nowadays we're talking about post-colonialism and post-modernist ideas translated as well. So which are reflected in here? But sorry, my question is: What is this? Are these tangas, you know, contemporary or? So I think, yeah, you're right. I think um, I'm not. Probably I might have said it wrong. Uh, I didn't mean that nothing was translated into Tibetan language. And obviously, Karl Marx and all those Lenin and Stalin, their theories were translated for certain pro purpose. <laughs> now, for example, if you're talking about the Western, for example. Uh, Western philosophy, and you can talk about Plato's Republic. For example, right now, one scholar is translating that into Tibetan. And if you want to study philosophy, I mean, Socrates and Plato, Aristotle, they, they, those would be the first one you want to grab. And these are just, it's not even translated yet. You know, so it's just in the process of being translated. Whereas if you compare that approach with Recently, I think, uh, Kagyur and Tengyur, Tibetan scriptures, they've agreed to translate it into English, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they got the fund for 140 years. So uh, at that time, I was uh, actually debating with one of the uh, Tibetan, and I said, like, the problem with our Tibetan culture is we don't have Lotsawa anymore. Lotsawa is a translator that looks at the outside world to bring the knowledge inside the Tibetan culture. What you have is you have those translators, like Geshe Tubdin Jimba. I, I really like him, but I said he's not Lotsawa. Lotsawa brings, you know, like Gendu Chumbi is Lotsawa. He always, he went to India for 12 years, studied there, and he always looked at it from a Tibetan perspective, and he translated everything that he thought was important into Tibetan language. And that tradition, you don't see why. I think many of the things has to do with the funding that people would fund it if 
Tibetan text is being translated into other language and not the uh, otherwise. So first thing that, and also I think um, um, there are some, uh, just to add on that, there are some who are doing those, those great jobs. And actually, uh, I can't take too much credit, but um, me and there's another scholar, we founded a, um, a website called Karkung, and our approach was uh, basically with that understanding that not many is being translated into Tibetan. So we try to translate um, uh, at least uh, one article or so into a Tibetan language, which is writ written in English and Chinese language. So I think there is a dearth of all those uh, article or any kind of uh, intellectual discipline that's being translated into Tibetan. And regarding, I think, um, uh, artwork, I think even I really like Gendu Chumbi's uh, approach, I think. I think for me, he's a uh, first modern Tibetan artist because um, not so much because what kind of painting or artwork he did, but just the attitude. I think he was he he, he has written a book called uh, it's Kama Sutra, Dubetenju, and in the book he talks about like you know I slept with this girl and the scripture says this, but when I was with her this didn't happen. So you guys have to experiment. So <laughs> he I think this approach. This, his approach was very individual. He's not, he's not uh, believing anyone. He's not believing Buddha. He, even he's not believing the Tibetan scripture. He went to India and read Dhammapada in Pali language and then translated it from there to Tibetan. So this, um, I think, the attitude of, uh, uh, of uh, individual self-expression, individually judging it, and uh, even in, at the end of the book, he says, uh, Mipang Rinpoche has translated the, uh, written the book in so and so years, but uh, I, a mendicant or like a mad monk, has written a very poor one. But uh, in the end, you guys can be the judge because I wrote it through experience. That's what he says. So, um, so I yeah, I I think uh, I think that individual expression I think takes for me personally. Just, I don't know, abroad and everyone, but just in Tibetan, sometimes um, we really don't uh, credit too much to, to individual ex uh, expression. We are very uh, comfortable at leaning either to Buddha or Buddha-like figure. So uh, for me, at this point in time, I think Tibetan contemporary art or modernism in Tibet, it means uh, being individual, I think. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, I'm not going to respond uh, into, to your question, Lama Jab, but I'm delighted that this exhibition space has created a communication and discussion between yourself. Uh, you are an expert on uh, the literature and music of um, of Amdo, and, and uh, so and uh, with the artists here here present, which luckily we're going to be able to continue in Oxford. So we won't we won't go further down that that track. I think. Um, what do you think, Fabio? Maybe one more question. Uh, is everybody fading? Okay, I think, okay, so in that, in that case, to give everybody a chance to have a drink and have a further discussion with the artists, let, me, let us all say thank you so very, so very much to these extraordinary people.